Hi all, let's continue our look at the evolution of chess style and continue looking at Mikhail Botvinnik in the 1941 USSR Championship. He was black against Igor Bondarevsky, who had won the USSR, USSR Championship the year before. So this is quite an interesting encounter. Uh, so Botvinnik playing black, Bondarevsky kicked off with e4 and Botvinnik chose again the French defence. So he'd been using this quite a bit in this tournament. We see after d4, d5, the advanced variation being chosen. After c5, not the usual c3 to support the pawn chain, but actually slightly rarer knight f3. After knight c6, most definitely c3 is the most common move here to support white's pawn chain. But uh, bishop d3 has been played. Bishop d3 was played instead. And it's a very interesting idea. I could call it, um, I sometimes refer to it as a kind of overprotection gambit. If you remember the influence of Aaron Nimzovich in this series, he, he had one concept about overprotecting central squares. And here the e5 square or pawn can be built on with huge pressure by white uh, to make it a strong point. And that's the idea of this gambit, I believe. So c takes d4. White doesn't care about the pawn. He just wants to make this e5 point a strong point. And what is particularly instructive about this game uh, is how Botvinnik tries to wrestle against this strong point, this e5 strong point here. He plays bishop c5, seemingly a little bit, you know, holding on to his extra pawn, materialistic. a3, as though maybe b4 might come in, and bishop b2. We see knight g e7. And actually, white didn't go for b4 here. White played knight bd2, preferring to qu uh, keep his queenside pawns intact. And now we see, instead of the routine casting, this could be quite risky actually in this position because of a Greek gift in any case. Botvinnik plays knight g6, so he's putting more pressure on e5 immediately. White counterattacks by t hitting the bishop. The bishop drops back. And now rook e1, trying to reinforce e5. Note with this maneuver, the f4 square is taken away from white, overprotecting e5 with the bishop for a moment. Bishop d7, again, not casting. Uh, so what is Botvinnik doing? Is he going to sort of play on the queen side soon? We see g3 as though there's an interest in kicking this knight. And that is one method that Nimzovich has mentioned that if you know you can't easily carry on your overprotection of a central point like e5, you can try and undermine the opponent's pieces. And the idea basically of this uh, is if you build up enough pressure behind the central point, it will start to make the break things like f6 impossible because it will actually eventually lose material. So how does Botvinnik counteract this strategy, this strong point strategy? Well, actually, he is willing to accept the potential of double pawns. He plays f6, willing to accept uh, you know, the possibility of his pawns being doubled, but he's wrestling aggressively the e5 point here. White did White did take on g6 after hg. We see queen d3. So is this a punishment for black's strategy, even though the rook is also activated? Well, there's actually two very good moves here. Black's position is actually very, very strong. Uh, the bishop is actually potentially also useful eyeing f2. Botvinnik shows king f7. But it turns out here, black's position is so strong that castling is also a very good idea. For example, queen takes, um, pardon me, queen takes, knight takes here. And you see that this bishop and the rook are coordinating on f2, sometimes like this. Now there's, you know, good pressure on f2. And, you know, something like queen f6. And again, f2. And this looks like a great position for black. So already black's position is strong. But Povenik chose the more interesting looking king f7. And there are ideas popping up here like rook h5, g5 even, to try and undermine and wrestle that e5 point. We see h4 trying to keep a grip on things. But now a nice sliding maneuver with the queen. Queen g8 coming to h7. And in fact, I'm pretty sure the influence of this game has been reaching French defence players. Uh, my good friend Alex Eflontis, I, I clearly remember playing this gambit against him and he playing exactly the same way. Wrestling immediately, the e5 point, not castling, allowing double pawns. And this, this maneuver with the queen is very, very powerful. 
black is trying to really fight these central squares and this plays an important part queen h7 because it facilitates later g5 so bishop d2 queen h7 it's a very very nice position for black he's really fighting the central squares now with things like g5 on the cards bishop b4 was played doesn't really matter doesn't change things g5 so wanting either the exchange of queens or there's going to be damage done to white's king side it's a bad position for white now queen takes rook takes e takes and now g takes and all of a sudden you know black center is starting to look quite formidable after h takes g but when it doesn't release control of the e5 square well he can't do this anyway it'll be a fork he just plays e5 here and the pawns are starting to get uh, ready to roll here with e4 we have g takes and the king supports e5 now so e5 is adequately protected white's overprotection strategy of e5 has been severely broken it's a model game example in fact of how to break the overprotection gambit if it's got a name i'm not particularly sure but it's a rare bird idea in the advanced variation of the french to sacrifice the d4 pawn to try and get this you know grip on e5 but here you can see it's a disaster bishop d6 tokenly hitting e5 it's just protected knight h4 and now some frets are emerging after rook g8 fretting rook takes h4 king h2 we see bishop f5 and now c2 is a big problem what is white doing here uh rook e2 and now d3 this is looking very very unpleasant rook d2 d takes c2 white's been completely destroyed his central control his king safety has been shot to pieces f4 it's a pretty miserable position in any case this just speeds things up i guess to the end bishop e3 we have now bishop takes e5 check knight takes f takes and the king actually just goes safely to e7 shielded by white's pawn uh, and in, in this position uh, we have rook f1 okay and now bob finishes quite neatly here not giving white any chance can you guess what he plays in this position if i give you five seconds starting from now i think it's a winning position anyway he just plays c1 distracting white winning material by force uh, it's absolutely crushing here if knight takes then just taking here and the c1 knight is exposed after so the knight's pinned here this is just winning material it's just completely winning c1 in this final position uh not really much else can be done after c1 um rook takes there's actually there might even be um stronger here than than bishop takes uh there might be an insertion of bishop f4 available uh in this position let's just check this out in this final position i did have a note on note on this instead of bishop takes d2 here well that's that's pretty strong as well but actually there's an even more crushing move pardon me rook takes h4 bishop f4 this this is uh this is even more crushing the, the position's gone for white anyway uh in the final position this this there's lots of moves that's um it's it's totally winning uh position just bishop takes d2 was good enough as well for for a winning advantage so it's how to smash up the overprotection gambit botvinik really did it in style in this game uh, again he shows certain dynamic tendencies uh, like the willingness to uh, delay castling the willingness to accept double pawns uh, the key issue was addressed by black you know white's attempt to get a stranglehold on the center was made to look like a pipe dream basically 
And I'm pretty sure this has influenced some French defense players in this particular variation of the advanced variation, where White's giving up the d4 pawn to try and get this grip on e5. So fantastically refuted in this model game, you can call it. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.